Perhaps some music, 
that'll be songs that have been picked out by the family. That will give us a little time for reflection. On behalf of the family of Stu Barnes, Karen, his wife, Amber and Babe, their two children, Taylor and Alicia, plus Jareth, who has, through this trying time, has arranged the music and photos for today's service. There's also Stu's mother, Hilda, his brother Mervyn and his wife, Alison, sisters Jenny and Beverly, their husbands, Ken and Gordy, plus all Stu's nieces and nephews, and grandnieces and nephews. Too many to mention. Beverly and Gordon cannot be here today because they are overseas and it was the wish of the family that they not break their trip and come home. It would be the last thing that Stu would want. Don't be so bloody stupid, would be Stu's reply. It is my privilege to welcome and thank you all for your attendance here. It means far more than you will ever know to a family that has been to hell and back over the past week and coped only due to the faith, their faith and the belief that their beloved Stu was not to blame. They know he would have done his utmost to protect his load and his beloved truck. So many unanswered questions troubled them regarding how this could possibly happen. Due to the situation of the crash site, they were asked to stay away. So they were left to sit and wonder until the report came through from the hospital that a medical condition affected Stu, making it impossible for him to control his truck. What he did at that time will possibly remain a mystery but it can be assured that he would have done all that was possible to prevent any damage. There is an advert on the tally at the moment regarding funeral insurance. And one guy says he does not want to be put into a rubbish bag and left out on the street for a truck to pick him up. <coughs> we who know Stu know that if that question was put to him, his answer would be, that will do me just fine. I don't want any fuss. That is the type of man he was. Absolutely no fuss is what he would want. I'm sorry, Stu. I've got news for you. The rest of us have too much respect for you to let this that happen. We intend to give you the type of send-off that you deserve. Certainly, we will, re we will respect the fact that you would not tolerate any bullshit or weasel words that try to make you into someone other than who you really are. Throughout history, there has been a collection of workers who were born into a particular occupation that they not only excelled in, but it became part of their lives. There were others who made things and consumers who were some distance away. These goods were of no use, just stacked in a pile. They had to be moved to those waiting. The Pony Express riders delivering mail, the stagecoach drivers, and then the traction engine drivers spring to mind. And of course today, we have truckies, where not only are the drivers heroes, but the trucks themselves attract devoted admirers. Truckies are born, not made. They have an extraordinary devotion to their work. There is a camaraderie that unites them as one. They are split into two main groups. The about town or short hill driver, short haul driver, and the more adventurous long distance one. These guys or girls have to put up with the challenges that sort out the real heroes from those still in Matthews. Nights away from home, stuck out in the middle of nowhere, broken down, or snow up to their private parts, driving up roads that were only meant for walking on, and of course, bloody inconsiderate and impatient motor car drivers. 
Not only have, like, one only has to follow a truck during the night to see that they communicate with each other with their blinker lights as they cannot see into the cab. I have no idea what they mean when the light blinks. And of course it's not sufficiently to bother other motorists but I am positive it is to make sure that all is well with the other driver. All the time they are prepared to respond if something is wrong. Stu loved his long haul in the island drives and I am convinced the fact that he never knew for certain where he was going until he arrived at work added to the love of the job. When he started the inter-island runs, there was a little boy next door who also loved the big rigs and couldn't wait for the school holidays so that, the, so that he could go with Uncle Stu and ride shotgun or something like that. I am sure Stu would have made him feel important. If it was permissible for Lance to travel on the travel in the truck, Lance would come back home, his feet several inches off the ground with stories of ultimate experiences and wonderment. Susie too had the exciting experience of travelling with Uncle Stu. On the other hand, if it was against the rules for Lance and Susie to travel in the truck, the story is just bullshit. I made it up. Lance and Susie went to Manor's for the holidays and watched trucking movies on TV and pretended they were travelling with other students. As the services to remember the life of Stu Barnes, who better to tell it than those who knew him? Firstly, we are going to hear from members of the family and then there will be an opportunity for others to make a contribution in the celebration of Stu's life. Don't be shy or think that your story will not be appreciated. I can assure you that what this family needs right now is to hear true stories of the guy who can no longer be with them. And remember, humour is a great healer. I would like to mention at this point, although Stu drove a truck with freight lines painted on it, he was employed by a nice Trans, Night Trans Limited, who contracted to freight lines. Talking to Barbara, Stu's boss for the last 18 years, she said that she could sum up Stu as an employee with just two words. They being loyal perfectionists. Also, the way he looked after that truck was unbelievable. There is also a story that Stu had to live with while working for Barbara and occasionally it was mentioned to him, not that he liked it, but it was mentioned to him. A brand new truck was purchased that was to be Stu's, but it was shipped to Mount Monganui. Barbara and Stu went down to pick it up and then Barbara told Stu that she was going to drive it home. <coughs> And he was not, and he was to be the passenger. Need I tell you that he was not amused. <laughs> but he sat in the passenger seat all the way. He did get a little excited when they nearly ran over a policeman. <laughs> who, not looking, stepped backwards, just missing the passing truck. But they drove on after Stu explained in no uncertain terms about the policeman's pedigree. <laughs> not sure if the policeman had missed his pants or not. <laughs> what a reception they got when they arrived. A good sized crowd had gathered too and could not believe that Stu was still in the passenger seat. He took some living down that moment. After that episode, Stu always accepted Barbara as a truck driver not a female truck driver, but a truck driver. Barbara said Stu was the first man to accept her as an equal. Sitting with us was Joe Wright, who said, may I endorse that? 
Montesquieu always treated me as an equal, not like some of the others who were known to comment on female writers. Well, that's about enough from me for now. May I call on the family to talk about the life of Stu Barnes? And so, somebody is kind of good at eulogy for us. <coughs> Thank you. Hi there everyone. Um, first off, I have got something written here from Karen. Um, I'd like to read it out first, if I may. Stuart and Karen met in 1985. Stuart just become an owner driver with Reed's Transport. Their friendship blossomed into a relationship and Life on the Road had a big new turn for Stu and Karen and Amber, Karen's two-year-old daughter. Over a period of time, Stu taught Karen to drive the Mac. They made a good team on the road. In 1997, Stu became a daddy to baby boy Jeff, not such a baby boy now. Um, he was a happy man as far as he was concerned. His family was now complete. He had his son and daughter. He used, his own, he used to own a Honda 1100cc and one day we were going to Rangitotu, excuse me, North Islanders, <laughs> but it was somewhere up there. <laughs> Stu was on the bike. Now if you can imagine the size of the bike and Stu's height, well tippy toes was the word. That bike could fly but out of how it comes to mine. We were living in Auckland when we lost the map. Stu went back and worked for a few different companies, Lynn Fox, Night, Night Trans, 1992. We moved to Derry Flat, working at Kiwi Fruit Orchard. There we got married and settled for 10 years. And like a lot of marriages, over time we separated and remained good friends. Stu bought a house in Papakura and which was a good thing, it allowed the photo album and the model collection to grow to an impressive size. And man, is it a size. <laughs> Some other highlights in Stu's life was his daughter Amber's wedding to Dave Corpse. Dave and Stu had a good friendship and special bond. Dave looked on Stu as a father figure. Stu became a grandfather to Amber and Dave's little girls, Taylor, now eight, and Alicia, Alicia. <laughs> three, I always call her the wrong name. <laughs> Who absolutely loved their papa. Stu always was a kind and generous man. The last few months of his life, he happily shared his home with his niece, Nikki, and her partner, Nick, and son, Jared. And I and I can be called stolen, as you believe. Cat, my cat stolen. Oh, and my cat, he called, uh, and my cat called, he called stolen. As we believed it lived about five doors along the road, when Stu came home, it would turn up and stay. And now to the present day. To sum it all up, Stuart had a complete commitment to his family, friends and work. He was a deep thinker, friendly, loyal, trustworthy and honest man who will be sadly missed but finally remembered. Thank you, Stu, for being you. That's from Karen Amber and... Okay. <laughs> Okay. Hi, I'm Amber. I'm Stu's daughter. This is Jared. I just want to say a little thing about how Dad and I started. Okay. It started with a tickle and a don't touch me. Well, how far we've come from that day 30 years ago. You took me as your own from day one, and after that rocky start, boy, did our relationship develop and grow. One day you came home with a pan to be a soft toy. 
I bet that day you gave me that, you didn't realise how cherished it would become. It has to be the most well-travelled panda in New Zealand, and I'm sure several of you here today could testify to that. As I grew up, we ended up with similar interests, trucks, models, and country music. This gave us a unique relationship that very few people understand. Apart from having Jareth, I've witnessed some of your happiest days, the day of my wedding, the birth of your first granddaughter, Taylor. You raced home from Wellington, got to the hospital just as visiting hours ended. You picked up Taylor and cried. The nurses were so touched by the scene that you were there still an hour later. They came, and then came the birth of Alyssa, as you used to call her, Alicia. <laughs> Your second granddaughter. You were so upset you couldn't see her for three days as you were stuck in Christchurch. Becoming a papa meant the world to you, the love to you. The love you and the girls have for each other is amazing. This leads me to the hard part. How do I stand here today and say goodbye to the most amazing, kind and lovable man in my life, my dad? I stand here knowing how much he loved me and his family. I stand here knowing how much his friends and colleagues meant to him. And finally, I stand here knowing he died doing what he loved. It doesn't stop the pain, but it helps a little. Goodbye, my giant teddy bear. I love you more than words can say. We all now have a garden and angel cruising heaven's highway. Hey, um, there was a poem written on the pamphlet that was written by my mother, and I added a little bit to it, so I will be reciting it for everyone here. A little boy was born, a steering wheel in his hand. He said, when I grow up, I'll be a truck driving man. He started his career at a young tender age, learned the ropes from old friends, on the road, they knew his name. His passion on the job took him many places. Making friends and taking photos took him to different spaces. His commitment to his family, friends, life, and work, there was never any duty that he would ever share. A full career he did have, many of you he did know, and now we have the honor task of driving him back home. We think of you of with memories and gaze up to the sky, your name will be remembered, a legend never dies. Just a few things of Stu's life as a young boy. He was a great gun builder. He built wooden guns. Wherever he could find timber, he'd be buying his guns. No matter where you went or who came to visit, always had a gun shoved in their hand and it was bang, bang, bang around this corner, bang, bang, bang around that corner. And if it broke, he'd go and make another one. Um, certain days of the week, Mum and Dad used to go to town to take the eggs and pick up the pig scraps. We had to go home from lunch from school and we had to gather the eggs. Mervyn and Stuart went and gathered the eggs. I got ordered to the kitchen to make the Edmunds custard and apricots for our lunch. And that was our lunch. 
we knew that they were in town. Another time, they were in town, they come home and um, they found three drunken kids. We all had very bad colds. They used to drink the creme de menthe and they always told us that they had bad colds, that's why they drank it. And us three kids had very bad colds that day and we polished the bottle off. <laughs> Um, he also had Morris Minor cars. He had a wee blue one and a wee green one. But he had a sign that he always had in that car. And it read, Due to the fantastic speed of this vehicle, all female passengers must sit close to driver. <laughs> <laughs> he had fishing trips. They had fishing trips up to Lake Coleridge and that. He had his two boats. And those fishing trips, they start off late in the afternoon and they'd be drinking all the way. They'd get up there, and they'd be still drinking. Tried to get the tent up, still drinking. Couldn't work out in the morning why the tent wasn't up properly. Another time they were out on the lake. They are fishing away and they seen this boat way, way over and the people were waving. They waved back. Friendly people over there, Stuart said. They carried on. These people started waving. Stuart waved back. They are very friendly. The next thing, they were all waving two hands. And he said, Well, better go and see. And he said, They all will be friendly. Got over there only to have the boat sink. That's <laughs> they got there. There's lots of memories that Merv and I could tell you about our brother. He was a skinny little runt. He used to come home when he was a kid and go out and do his beloved play. He started building these track models. If he didn't like one, he'd smash it. But then he had to build something to put the smash model on. It was either a tow truck or a low bed. And Stuart, you smashed your truck and we ain't got nothing that you can build to put it back on. Yes, Stu, you were a truck driving boy, but to me, you were my big brother, who has gone and grew more important and loved you more every day. My kids thought the world of you. But you were the uncle, you were the king of uncles to them. I promise you, Stu, I'll look after Mum. She will be okay. Please say hi, big hi and kiss and hug to Uncle Bruce, Uncle Travis, Kenneth, and most of all, Dad. We are all together now with each other to look over. You're all together now to look over each. All together now to look over us, all of us and kick our butts when we need one. Rest in peace, Stu, and happy tracking in the sky. We were talking before the service and yesterday that he didn't feel that he uh, could be up to it. And I said, well, make, up that, make that decision when the time arrives. And if you... Want to say something there? If not, I'm sure people will understand. That's really good. I'm sorry, I thought you went away. <laughs> I said before, Beverly and Gordon are away overseas at the moment, but we've been in communication with them. And their two children who are here today, Angie and Douglas, would like to read out something on their behalf. 
strong enough to make it. Yeah. Hi all, thank you for being here today. Um, we would like to read a message from our mother Bev, um, who wishes she could be here today, but unfortunately we cannot make it back. Um, Stu, you are my big brother, the one who has always made me laugh and smile. When I was a little girl you called me Grizzles, but as I grew up the closer we became. You took me down to do your freight run, and you always proudly introduced me to everyone. You then shifted to Wellington to work for Paul Pretty Removals. Home became quiet. I was always so excited when you, came, when you came home to visit. And one day you arrived home on your motorbike and asked if I wanted to go to Wellington with you. I had such a great time and took, you took me to meet all of your friends. When I started going out with Gordy, we spent quite a lot of time together. You would stay at my flat whenever you were down. At our engagement party, you found out that Gordy was slightly older than me. Ah, uh, sorry, slightly older than Stu. Bloody cradle snatcher. There's hope for me yet, you would say. <coughs> On my wedding day, you joked that I only had another month to wait until I could get into the pubs, so I didn't really have to get married just to get into the pubs. Life got busy after that, and we would talk every now and again. We both had families, and they were always our number one priority. The last few years, we have spent a lot of time together. Whenever we got to go up to your house, you were always pleased to see us, but you were also bloody pleased to see us leave. <laughs> the last couple of years, we have had Nikki boarding with you. It's great for me to watch you get to know my two girls. I know Nikki and Nick and their crazy friends gave you a heap of entertainment. Oh, and then, oh my God, Anne would come up and stay with Nikki. What the hell did I ever do to deserve this, you would say. With the biggest laugh and grin, he would always say. You loved having both the girls there because they got a bit crazy together and provided you hours of entertainment. But right now, I want to kick you, and you know I do. We are all so far away at the moment and feeling useless right now. You have left us far too early. There is a huge empty hole in our lives now. We will miss your humour, cheesy grin, but we will never forget. And you will stay in our hearts forever. <laughs>